Thank you much. Um, today we're going to talk about signal processing to geolocate, meaning where do you find the signal on the earth in the first place? A lot of people, they start further down the chain where you've got the signal, you've got the bits, you're playing that with it. But someone's got to grab the signal in the first place. And it turns out it's a challenging problem to find signals. So, uh, myself, I graduated from this very school. Um, it was very worth doing. So, those of you who are despairing, uh, keep working at it. Uh, love my work. It's the kind of thing where I say I get paid also. I get this wonderful bonus every couple of weeks for getting to do this about it. Um, also, Raytheon is hiring. So, if you're a U.S. citizen and need a job, come talk to me afterward or grab one of my cards and send me an email. And uh, just in terms of full disclosure, I will get a bonus if you hire out a rate down. I'll be as honest as possible anyway, and I won't just think about my own bonus. Okay, so that takes care of uh, where I'm from and uh, where I'm working currently. I'm um, going to talk at a fairly high level about three different geolocation topics. Uh, one of them is direction finding. And like a practical example of that was when the guy put the um, satellite antenna dish on my house. He had something on the TV screen and he turned the dish and watched until he maximized the power. That was direction finding. So that's just where you scan to hit some maximum in your power. Uh, airplanes use it to do uh, navigation in the old days and how they do GPS. Uh, geolocation via CAF processing. CAF processing is a high power method for finding things locations on the Earth. Very computationally expensive, however. And that leads us to the last bullet where we're teaming with Rice University, who's also teamed with Caltech and a couple other universities, to try to greatly reduce the computational burden of finding where signals are. Okay, so direction finding. As I said, you point the antenna until you hit the maximum power. Um, if you do this manually, it's very easy just to sweep right past something and miss it. So there's a little danger doing that. One of our jobs, the job I'm lucky enough to work on at Raytheon, is automating this process. Can we just scan an antenna back and forth and find signals out in the environment automatically, not to manually, painfully find them ourselves? Uh, another problem with manually scanning is you might be scanning your antenna, and what if you have a burst signal that turns on now, but it's off when you're pointing at it? You might miss it entirely. And there's more and more burst signals out there that are hard to find. Okay, so what is the solution for this? Well, Mother Nature gives you a big help. The antenna has a pattern. So as you scan something, scan an antenna past a signal, you get that same pattern. Well, there ones that are uh, Fourier transform or Fourier optics, and I'm not familiar with that. And uh, how many folks are familiar with the SETI project? <coughs> Search for extraterrestrial. Intelligence. Well, something neat about antenna pattern is that that's just basic physics. So that's something SETI was doing, was just looking for an antenna pattern, figuring if some extraterrestrial intelligence had that, we could see that sync like variation. Okay. By the way, I encourage questions as I go, because I'm going to be hitting a lot of different topics here. So please interrupt me if you have a question as we go. Okay, so let's talk about antenna pattern for a moment. That little picture, here that four o'clock, that's an antenna pattern would look like from the top as you scan the antenna. And you hopefully had this in your physics classes, that basically your antenna pattern is the wavelength over the diameter of the antenna. So that gives you how wide the beam angle is. And then that's also equivalent to, there it is, to, uh, you know, something over frequency times the antenna diameter. So the bigger your antenna, the smaller the beam pattern. The higher the frequency, the smaller the beam pattern. So I was driving by Lockheed Martin by the corporate headquarters in California. And they have these uh, antennas as big as this room to communicate with their satellites. And I was thinking, what a nightmare that the smallest vibration or the smallest misalignment probably gets your signal entirely. So ironically, the smaller your antenna, the wider the beam pattern, the easier it is to find and see it. But the disadvantage is the smaller your antenna, 
the less energy you sell to have, so you have less power we see. So that's one of the trade-offs we need to make in the program. Okay, so uh, I call this slide, Convolution is Better Than Human. So remember I started by talking about a human steering antenna looking for a signal. Very easy for a human to miss a signal. Or for instance, if you get an impatient technician, he'll sweep right past a bunch of stuff and miss it. So one of my jobs is, well, can we automate this and have consistent performance when we're looking for something or characterizing the environment? So one good thing is that we're finding signals that humans would miss. And I have a story I love about that. We tested our equipment with a customer, and they're doing things by hand, and they're finding all these signals. We turn on our automatic system, and it's only finding half of them. He's like, well, obviously your system is junk. We regret having hired you and all that great stuff. So. And then uh, one of our guys said, well, wait a minute, let's try swapping antennas. And all of a sudden our system was performing wonderfully. And it turned out our antenna had broken in transit. The customer looked at our data, and they could find nothing in the data by themselves. Our system, because we beat down the problem was able to So then the customer was extremely happy. happy. So we're very bad, very good, and say, wow, I can't believe what your system has done. So, so as I just said, it integrates over the whole antenna pattern. So you have a signal, your antenna is scanning past it, you're integrating, 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 you're integrating the whole antenna pattern for the data to find the signal. So you have more data to work with. And that's why you can find things that you can never see. Um, as great as we like to say our system is, humans are still better at some things. Humans bring outside knowledge like, oh, that rolls off, or, or those are Siamese peaks and not separate peaks. But uh, for isolated signals are by themselves, we're doing awesome, we're great at You might ask yourself, well, if this is wonderful, doing the antenna pattern stuff, why aren't we doing it already? Or why haven't we always been doing it? It turns out it's very computationally intensive. It doesn't sound that bad, but we have to go over every frequency point and every spatial point to do this. And then over every point over the antenna pattern. And we built our first system it took weeks to scan from 2 to 18 gigahertz with a 37 meter dish. Through lots of hard work to some bright programmers and working on the algorithm and getting some faster equipment, we got that down to 12 hours. So we're very proud of ourselves. So a lot of the effort, basic math is actually fairly easy. You can write that out in the afternoon. It took us months to make it fast enough to work on clever approximations and such. Okay, so I love this picture on the bottom. Uh, and I apologize the lines are pretty light, so they're kind of hard to see. But that's what a human would have seen if he pointed right at the signal we were looking at. And after we beat the problem down by convolving the antenna pattern, you can get this nice clean bump here where that gray bar is. So I thought that was a really neat, powerful result. Okay, any questions on that? Uh, something else this gives us is um, our customers don't want to bother with the signal if it's too noisy or too weak, or they don't want to waste a bunch of manpower trying to hook up to it. It's too weak. So something we have to go into this is we're already fitting this antenna pattern. We can do the statistical chi-square and get a measure of the goodness of fit of our antenna pattern to the data. So this is a nice metric of how well is this process working. So here on the uh, your left side there, on the upper left, this one. That's a less powerful signal, and it might be kind of hard for humans to spot that. By the way, that's a, what you would see. That's azimuth versus ele to elevation versus azimuth. But, uh, the one below is a much more powerful antenna pattern. You can clearly see, ah, that looks like a, the energy from the signal. I like this one on the upper right side. That's a burst signal. So our antenna is scanning horizontally in this case, and the frequency is vertical. So sometimes we go to scan and the signal have to be off, you get a black spot, go a little further, and the signal will have to be on. So we're looking at using this metric as a method for looking for when we have burst signals. 
And that would be very easy for a human to miss. If a human pointed at it and just happened to be at it when it's off, a human wouldn't see that same thing. And then the lower, uh, lower right one shows a case of non verse They get this nice traditional antenna pattern. Remember this, as in the horizontal and the frequency vertical. So we thought, wow, we're on to some great stuff here. This convolution is uh, working incredibly well in the frequency domain. So we can evolve spatially over azimuth validation, spatial antenna pattern, and look at the frequency domain. Um, do you think it would work as well in the spatial domain? Do you think it would work as well if we just involved in this you know, plot as in the domain? You can't be wrong on this one. So the answer is yes and no. The good news is that it did clean the plots up a lot, so they looked a lot more like the bottom plot. They tend to look more like that than that. But remember, convolution is a smoothing function also. So if we had two peaks near to each other, the convolution would smear it into one peak. Or sometimes it would pull the peaks off towards the edge of the plot. So it didn't work quite as well as we hoped in the spatial domain. So for the spatial domain, to find things in azimuth and elevation, elevation azimuth, we just do a least squares fit. So we use that antenna pattern, do a least squares fit to it, to say, you know, oh, there's our signal. You know, point your antenna there to that. Okay, some questions. Move on. Okay, so that was direction finding. That's relatively simple, so we we'll whisked through that pretty quick. Uh, now we're going to go into a more, um, high, more computational, more powerful in some ways method for uh, doing cat processing. So for doing geolocation. Let's go back for a moment, and uh, no, no, this will come up in a second. Okay, so let's do what I call geolocation 101. So when you talk about triangulation, you've probably heard before that you need three listeners or collectors to geolocate something to locate it. And that's just basically the GPS problem in reverse. Uh, you just send a bunch of signals to a listener, and it can find its location. Or the transmitter can send a signal and three listeners can figure out where it's at. So the problem works in both directions. It turns out you can also do the problem with just two collectors. So that's what we'll talk about in a minute, but that's the uh, aircraft, antenna stations, people, whatever are expensive. So you want to try to do these problems with the smallest number of assets you possibly can. Okay. But to do that problem, to do it with just two listeners, or two collectors, you need some assumptions. So how do you lock down that third dimension with only two measurements? Well, one is that you have to say the emitter is on the Earth's surface. Another one is that the emitter is not moving. And then the third one is you know how your collectors are moving. And uh, I had a fun story. A friend of mine loves model airplanes. And he bought a hiker's GPS. And he didn't finish the story. At that point, I said, I know your problem. But he continued, and I applied to listen. So he puts his hiker's GPS in his airplane and goes, Dave, this thing measured my plane was going like 400 miles an hour. Well, we both knew that was not even possible. He said, Let me guess. You got a hiker's GPS, and it builds in the assumption that you're on your surface. So they saved some money and made a cheaper problem. Because they need a more expensive GPS to make that assumption. He did around a lot more expensive than So anyway, point being that if you're on your surface, really simplifies your problem. Okay, so let's talk about the three ball, they call it collector case. Ball equals collector of this. And so this this term here, C is a speed of light, T D O A is time difference on the line. So if we look here, one and two, that means the time of flight between the emitter that spits out a signal and when it hits collector one, so whatever that time of flight is, minus the time of flight from the emitter to the second collector. 
So with that equation, all we know is that there's some time difference. So we've got the information from both collectors. They both have a copy of the signal. We can figure out some time difference between them. Okay, and then uh, the rest equation is just what I said. It, it's the uh, distance between these. And then you do the same thing for collectors two and three. Okay, so you need two equations, two unknowns, and you can find your location on here. And what are our two unknowns? They're azimuth and elevation, or x and y. That's why I have to constrain it to their surface, because we can't handle z with just two measurements. Okay. So, um, this case is three collectors, it's similar to the GPS problem. It's velocity agnostic, so if anything's moving in the problem, that's okay, doesn't bother it. There's no velocity terms in the equation, just position terms. It only involves time measurements, so your equipment's a little bit simpler. And um, you can pick any two pairs you want. The third pair is just a uh, linear combination of the other two, so any two pairs you want. Okay, so that's your basic triangulation problem there. Okay, now the little bit more fun case is, uh, can you do it with just two? And the answer is yes, you can. But you need a little bit more information. <coughs> So that first equation is the same. You use one TDOA equation, but now you add an FDOA equation, frequency difference on arrival. It's also called differential dot. So now you've got all these velocity terms. And what it is is you're measuring the do Doppler between the emitter and the first collector, and the Doppler between the uh, emitter and the second collector. Find that difference in Doppler. That gives you another equation of the problem. So it's a heck of a lot more processing, but now you only need two assets instead of three. Okay. Now, um, these two, that's the easy part of the problem. If you can find the TOA and the FUA, or the TOA and the TOA, the equations are simple, you can calculate it, but it's easy. Unfortunately, it's relatively difficult to figure out what that time difference is. So how do you do that? Okay. Enter something called CAF processing, which stands for cross ambiguity function. And I have yet to have find someone who can tell me how they came up with that name. It doesn't instantly scream at you what it does. So anyway, what it does is it correlates your signal with itself. So the first collector has one copy of the signal. The second collector has another copy of it. I forgot to subscript this with ones and twos. I should have done that. So you take one copy, and then you take the second copy, and you keep shifting in time until the correlation shows a match. And you say, ah, there's my time shift. And you also you change it in frequency, which stretches the points out the time domain. So you change the frequency until you get a match. That'll lead to a peak, and that'll tell your TOA and your TOA. Okay, this is an extremely powerful technique because you're using the data itself to find the data itself. That's an optimal filter. You can't do better than using the exact same thing to find itself. You have two copies of the signal, one from one collector, one from the other. Okay. Uh, it's agnostic of modulation type. You don't care if it's uh, QAM 16 or QAM 32 or FSK, you don't care about all that stuff. Doesn't matter, just all it needs is, my last goal here, enough riches, richness in the time and the frequency domains that you can do a non-trivial correlation. So for instance, if you have a signal that's just a single frequency, just a tone, that's not enough richness to use this technique on it. Or if you have a signal that's a single time Pulse, a delta function time domain. That's not enough richness to do the problem. And uh, I forgot my first slide, but a quick side trip. Uh, we're also doing a project at the university to automatically identify different signal modulations. So find a FRAM 16 versus FRAM 32, etc. Uh, that's with Daimizu. Put your hand with Daimizu, I know you are. And her professor, uh, John Matthews. So one reason I didn't talk about that is I'm hoping to go to one of her talks when she presents her group and you can learn about some other exciting stuff. Okay, 
back to the geolocation problem. So what you do then is this process of CAF processing builds what's called a CAF plane. So on one axis, you've got a TOA axis, and that's the axis that measures your time shifts. So zero there means no shift between the signals. And as you move away from zero, it gets more and more shift between your signals. And then the um, frequency axis measures your differential doppler, your change in frequency. So you vary both the shift and the frequency until you get a perfect match that results in the peak. And then by looking up where that FDOA and TOA numbers occur, that gives you this TOA number you need to go back to the geolocation equation to find your error. Okay. Um, also, the width of this peak, if you have a lot of error in your signal, this width will give you the error in your TOA and FDOA numbers. That's the way to get the error. Okay. Um, as you might guess, your signals can be extremely long, right? Even a few seconds of signal can be millions or possibly billions of points. And then the finer resolution to do your cat plane, the more accurately you can geolocate the same on your surface. So this involves tremendous amounts of computation. And uh, for a lot of problems, it would take a rack as tall as I am, or 10 racks as big as I am, depending on how much resolution, how big a problem you're going after. But, but, so, some, sorry, but, but at some point, is there where enough is enough? You say we've got enough to signal to get what we need, we don't need to have. Right. Very good question, and that is correct. There is a law of diminishing returns at some point. And that's part of my job to say when is enough and when is enough. And uh, on the flip side, there are people that always want things more accurate. Right? If you're searching for a lost hiker, a half kilometer might not sound so bad. It might take a human hours to comb a half kilometer by a half kilometer area. So anything you can do to drive down those numbers is often a benefit in terms of other human time. But on the flip side, your transmission may not be long enough to beat down the problem, or your equipment may not be good enough to beat down the problem. So it is a good trade-off. That's right. So, and then just looking ahead to what I'll be talking about towards the end, uh, Rice University has this whiz-bang algorithm that greatly reduces this computation of burden. So they're hoping to go from a rack of equipment as tall as I am to you know, something about the size of a paperback book or a cigarette box or something like that. So we'll talk about that. Okay, so there's two ways to do the problem. Remember I talked about doing correlations? And uh, hopefully there's some processing classes that you can uh, do your correlations and your convolutions in Fourier space and it's much faster to do. So there's two ways to do the problem. I'm going to gloss over this and not go deeply into detail so we can finish on time. But uh, there's a way that's called TUA dominant, where you shift the frequency by multiplying by this E to the I term. And then use your Fourier methods to convolve in the frequency space. Or you can convolve in the time domain and then use your convolution of the frequency domain to shift the frequency. So two methods. And uh, just for fun, I tried both of them. And uh, not too surprisingly, the FDOA dominant method is five times faster. So unless you have a reason to give up on a lot of resolution or information, you definitely want to do the FDOA, FDOA dominant method of cat computation. Uh, just another quick aside, um, this type of processing is common in sonar. It may be very similar. Okay. Um, Craig or route bounds. Remember before, flip back real quick, I said the width of this peak would give you how much error you have in your time and frequency measurements, and hence how much error do you have in your um, in your position on the earth and map to that error. Well, if you don't know that for sure, you don't always, or if you're designing a system up front. There's these wonderful equations called the Kramer route bounds, saying this is a theoretical minimum error you can get on these tiny and frequency measurements. Okay, they're not as hairy as they look. Um, you got this one over square root SMR term. The better your SMR, the lower your error. 
No surprise to me. And then you've got a B term, which is bandwidth. The more bandwidth you have, the lower your error. Again, no surprise, right? More bandwidth, more energy, more information. And then you've got a, same, a similar problem for uh, frequency. That more SNR, less error, more bandwidth, and more time span on this error. Okay. Um, so this is another thing alluding to what Rice is doing. If you have a collector that's far away, as you all are young from your physics classes, your signal drops one of our squares. Right? Approximately the signal is important to move away, the energy drops off very fast. However, your footprint is growing. So your noise is going up as approximately r squared also. So your signal to noise doesn't drop as one over r squared if you have competing emitters. It actually goes more like one over r to the fourth. And I call it a pedagogic approximation because it doesn't take into account your scourge. I assume the flat is that I talk about. You get the basic idea. So, this is also part of what's motivating Rice University to make this problem smaller, is the closer you can get, the less intention problem is, the better your signal to noise. So Rice's idea is, gee, if we get something small and we put that in a rescuer's backpack, that's a much nicer problem than being you know, a huge standoff distance as a helicopter or an airplane or whatever. So that's part of the motive is, if we can shrink the size, you can make up for small size by getting closer. Or, because smaller things are cheaper, we can have more closer assets. You can have 10 or 100 guys with these things on the backs, rather than one huge, expensive asset that might take two hours to get. Okay. So, um, just a little change of pace here. Um, so, we've been talking about how you can locate things on the Earth. And it turns out, often more important is how accurate do you know that number? And I've literally seen cases where you do the computation and you have missed the planet errors. The computation says your error ellipse is bigger than the whole Earth. Is it worth your time to look for that? Not even. Right? You're never going to find it with that kind of error. So it's very important to the error analysis problem. And by the way, that's my job with the Rice folks, is I'm doing the error analysis to see how good their timing has to be, how long you have to listen to your question, and things like that. So let's uh, look at this first equation. And that's just your 1D thing, right? If you have some error times the inverse of this derivative, it gives you the error in the position. So this maps error in time to error in position. Okay. Easy enough, right? That was your first calculus class, hopefully, or your first physics class. Okay, it gets really complicated when you go to 2D. So we do the 2D problem, and I didn't show all the just a little flavor. Now yeah, there's a Jacobian matrix, and do transposes, and multiplies, and inverses, and do eigenvalues, and all that jazz. Um, it was not that long ago, when I first started my career, they would pay folks like myself and my co-workers to do this job at hand. And it would take months to do the derivatives, check if they're right. It was extremely error prone. It was pages and pages of algebra. So boy, was I happy. I, mean, I don't expect you to read all this, but this is a page of that code. It does the eigenvalue problem, the derivative symbolically, everything I did in the afternoon is taking months. So if you don't do uh, bat lab and some of the symbolics, that's a crime. The other thing I highly recommend is the IPython notebook. I've been extremely impressed with the uh, symbolic capability and what I've been able to pull out quickly that product. Okay, so that's the error problem. And just an example of output I did. So um, this circle on the bottom, it's a little hard to see it's a circle, but that, that is a circle on the base of that. That's the footprint of a UAD. 
and then you have another helicopter, something that's hovering straight above the middle point of the map. And in each position on this plot, whoops, that used to this Macintosh thing, it's too simple. <coughs> And then each position on this plot indicates an error for if your collector's in that position. Okay? So see this really tall ridge at the top? That's actually infinite, right at the very edge of it. What that is is when the two collectors line up, there's a degeneracy in the equations. So the answer moves up. So that's a geometry you want to avoid. Right? And imagine the ultimate degeneracy. Let's say you have two collectors and you put them in the same location. The ultimate degeneracy. Well, your equations blow up, right? You can't get new information from the same location. So that's what that indicates. And uh, so this is what I did to characterize this, their system, tell them how accurate I would expect it to be, what would be out for positions, what would be in the Okay, so any questions on that? You're the perfect audience. If I don't schedule for finishing on time, I want to This is good. Please ask questions if you have. Okay, um, I'm just going to gloss over this as it's not really our stuff, but Raytheon is a is from Rice University, a gentleman named uh, Professor Richard Baranuk, and uh, he does this thing called compressive sensing. Okay, so the basic idea is that um, many problems are way over sales and you really don't need all the information that's in the signal. And a great example of that is you take an image with your uh, cell phone or your camera. Right? Nobody saves it in raw format. Right? The file's ten times as big. And if you compress it by a factor of two or ten, you lose what, maybe one percent, two percent, maybe at most ten percent. So that's kind of the same idea here as he says, well, what if we sample the data much more sparsely than it presents to us? The other thing is a lot of things, and AST is very guilty of this, what do you do when you want less data? You just take every other point, or every third point, or whatever, right? That's, well, that's very simple. The problem with that is that you're introducing Fourier effects, you're introducing you're introducing a new frequency effect in your data by doing so. So by randomly or irregularly sampling the data, he gets away from these frequency filtering effects you get from doing regular steps. The other thing he does is he just binarizes the data. Just gets rid of all the 12 or 14 bits your digitizer might do and just goes zero down. Just picks a threshold and binarizes it. And one more for that is your computations are extremely fast. And the goal here is to have a much smaller and much faster processing power. So his goal is to go from the rack of equipment to the paperback book. Much smaller. Okay. So the problem set up. The first step is you just make all your locations into a grid and you label them. So each grid point here just gets an index number. So the upper left point is one, the next one is two, the next one is three, etc. Okay. And then, without diving too deeply into details, use this to build the psi matrix. And something you have to kind of let go of here is that you see a matrix and you're thinking, ah, x, y, azimuth elevation. That's not the case here. Your uh, horizontal dimension here horizontal dimension is just the just the indices of all your locations. So there's nothing magic about x and y here on the side. And then your vertical axis is what your signal would look like if there was a um, say, uh, the middle of that position. So I realize I'm kind of glossing over that. This matrix represents the positions and what the signals look like. Next slide. So it's really a 
beautifully simple thing, so it just says, let's just make a matrix. So I, here's all my measurements. Whatever they, need can, whatever they can be, he applies this to all kinds of things, images, uh, sound, our geolocation, anything's fine. And then they have a side matrix that translates these positions into measurements. Okay? But we don't we don't have a problem of we know the position we'll want to find the measurement. We've got the problem of we know the measurements, how do we find the positions? Okay? And the next slide shows the same thing just for two different locations. Well, uh, all you got to do, you know, all in quotes, it's really easy, right? Is you just have to convert this matrix, move it over to the other side, boom, you solve the problem. Okay. It sounds easy, but the big challenge is that that matrix is absolutely huge. But he's done sparse sampling, so the matrix is relatively sparse. So does sparse matrix techniques. So that's my talk. Do you have any other questions? Thanks, Dane.